Welcome. Today we will be building the Calculus 3 second derivative test from the ground up and using animations in tandem to give us a visual intuition of how it works. In Calculus 1, we learned about critical points. These were places on our graph where the tangent slope was equal to zero. To find them, we set the derivative of the function equal to zero and solve for x. In order to determine whether the critical value was a local maximum or minimum, we would use the second derivative test. The second derivative test in Calculus 1 was easy to understand visually. As a brief synopsis, the second derivative can be thought of as the concavity of a point on the function. If a critical point has a second derivative that's less than zero, then it is concave down and thus is a local maximum. If a critical point has a second derivative greater than zero, then it is concave up and thus is a local minimum. If the second derivative at a critical point is zero, we say the test has failed. In Calculus 3, another second derivative test exists that is less easy to visualize. My goal in this video is to provide you with the knowledge of this test's inner workings. The first half of the video is dedicated to review and derivation of the Calculus 3 second derivative test, whereas the second half of the video is dedicated to intuition building animations. Before we start exploring the second derivative test, we should first discuss a few key building blocks, one of which being the directional derivative. The directional derivative of a function f in the direction of the vector u at some point x, y, z is defined as the gradient of f evaluated at the point, then dotted with the unit vector u. The gradient of f can be written as the vector containing the following entries the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and the partial derivative of f with respect to y. I will be using the subscript notation for partial derivatives for simplicity's sake. Next, let us define the x and y components of the unit vector u as a and b. By definition, unit vectors have magnitude 1, so a squared plus b squared must equal 1. After following this process, we find the formula for the directional derivative is the partial derivative of f with respect to x times a plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times b. So the directional derivative is aptly named as it represents the slope at some point in the direction of u. In the plot to the right, the black arrow represents the unit vector u. Notice that following the arrow's direction on the surface f creates a two-dimensional curve, shown in red. We learned how to deal with such curves in Calculus 1. For the given example, we see the slope in the given direction is negative, and the directional derivative confirms our visual suspicion. For the second example, the directional derivative is positive, as the function f is increasing in the given direction. What happens if we apply the directional derivative twice in the direction of u? Well, we end up with an expression as follows. The second partial derivative of f with respect to x times a squared plus two times the mixed second partial derivative of f times a and b plus the second partial derivative of f with respect to y times b squared. This expression will be the central emphasis of this video. But what does a second directional derivative represent geometrically? As it turns out, there is a nice extrapolation from the second derivative we learned about in Calculus 1. The second directional derivative applied in the same direction u both times represents the concavity at point x, y, z in the direction of u. In the plot to the right, we see the second directional derivative is positive, as the red curve, defined by the function f and unit vector u, is concave up. I left the steps to get to the second directional derivative expression as a problem to be worked through. If you work through the steps, recall that the mixed partial derivatives 
f sub xy and f sub yx are equal if the function f is twice continuously differentiable. This finding is often referred to as Clairaut's theorem. Critical points in multivariable calculus follow nicely from critical points in single variable calculus. If a point on the function f is a critical point, its partial derivatives with respect to x and y must be equal to zero. Notice that in the example to the right, the slope in the x direction is zero, as is the slope in the y direction. So the point in the plot is a critical point. Notice that if f sub x and f sub y are zero, then the directional derivative is zero in all directions. This means that the point is, in a sense, on flat ground. When standing on flat ground, it is possible to be on a perfectly flat plane. It is also possible to be at a relative minimum or maximum value. However, another possibility exists called a saddle point, an example of which is in the plot to the right. The second derivative test, of which this video is about, can categorize most critical points as either relative minimum, relative maximum, or saddle points. If a critical point of a function f is found at point x, y, z, then the second derivative test to categorize the critical point is as follows. First, define d to be equal to f sub xx times f sub yy minus f sub xy squared, all of these being evaluated at the critical point. If d is greater than zero and f sub xx is greater than zero, then the critical point is a relative minimum. If d is greater than zero and f sub xx is less than zero, the critical point is a relative maximum. If d is less than zero, the critical point is a saddle point. Finally, if d equals zero, then the second derivative test is inconclusive. So the critical point being tested could be a relative minimum, maximum, or saddle point. But why? This test is often taught without any explanation as to where these expressions come from, nor what they mean intuitively. My goal in this video is to share how this test can be built from straightforward principles. Before we begin deriving the second derivative test, let us first look at what doesn't work. When I was in Calculus 3, it seemed intuitive that the following tests should work to categorize a critical point. If f sub xx is greater than zero and f sub yy is greater than zero, then the concavity being up in the unit directions should indicate a local minimum. If f sub xx and f sub yy are less than zero, then the concavity being down in the unit directions should indicate a local maximum. Lastly, if f sub xx and f sub yy are of different signs, then we have found a saddle point. However, it only requires one counterexample to prove that this test doesn't always work. Notice in the plot to the right that f sub xx is positive and f sub yy is positive, yet the point is clearly a saddle. So this test is incomplete and doesn't always produce correct results. Now we are finally ready to derive the second derivative test. We start with the second directional derivative expression from earlier. Recall that this expression represents the concavity in the direction of u. Next, factor out a b squared from each term. We know a real number squared is always positive, so b squared is always positive. Therefore, if the following expression is positive, then the directional concavity is positive or if the expression is negative, the directional concavity is negative. So the following expression tells us the sign of the directional concavity, f sub xx times a divided b squared plus two times f sub xy times a divided b plus f sub yy. Recall that a and b are the x and y components of the unit vector u. So the variable a divided b intrinsically contains the information pertaining to the direction u is pointing. 
Notice that treating a divide b as a variable for our expression yields a quadratic form. Let us make use of the quadratic formula. Recall that the discriminant of the quadratic formula is the information under the root. The discriminant of our expression is 4 times f sub x y squared minus 4 times f sub x x times f sub y y. The discriminant gets its name because the sign of the discriminant holds information about a quadratic's roots. If the discriminant is negative, then there are no real roots, since the square root of a negative is an imaginary number. This means that the quadratic function is either entirely positive or entirely negative. If the discriminant of our quadratic expression is negative, then the inequality can be rewritten to resemble what we saw in the second derivative test. If the discriminant is negative, the tested critical point is either a relative minimum or maximum, as the sign of the directional concavity is always positive or always negative, regardless of the direction of u. Now all we need to do to delineate between the two possibilities is sample a point on our quadratic. This will show us if our function is concave up in all directions at the critical point, indicating a minimum, or concave down in all directions, indicating a maximum. Therefore, if f sub xx is greater than zero, the critical point is a relative minimum. Whereas, if f sub xx is less than zero, then the critical point is a relative maximum. If the discriminant is positive, then the quadratic has two real roots. This means that the directional concavity is sometimes positive or sometimes negative, depending on the direction of u. If the discriminant of our quadratic expression is positive, it can be rewritten to resemble what we saw in the second derivative test. So, if the evaluated discriminant is positive, then the critical point is a saddle point as the directional concavity is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. If the discriminant is zero, then the quadratic has a single root of multiplicity two. For our quadratic expression, this indicates that the directional concavity is either entirely positive or negative, besides a single value having concavity zero. If our quadratic expression's discriminant is zero, it can be rewritten to resemble what we saw in the second derivative test. It isn't immediately obvious why the discriminant being zero results in an inconclusive test. For this reason, there will be animated examples demonstrated later in the video. For the next section of the video, I will be utilizing MATLAB animations to demonstrate the different cases of the second derivative test. In the upper right is a graph of the directional derivative plotted against the x component of the unit vector u. In the lower right is a graph of the second directional derivative, or the directional concavity, also plotted against the x component of the unit vector u. These plots will track along with the three-dimensional surface plot to the left as the unit vector u, the black arrow, does an entire rotation. For this first example, I have chosen a non-critical point. Notice how the directional derivative isn't always zero. So the second derivative test cannot be applied in this case, as the chosen point is not critical. However, we can still make use of the second directional derivative plot to help us visualize what directions are concave up, concave down, or of zero concavity. For the next example, the second derivative test for this critical point will result in a local minimum because f sub xx times f sub yy minus f sub xy squared is greater than zero, and f sub xx is greater than zero. Notice that the directional derivative plot in blue is always zero, indicating a critical point. Also notice that the second directional derivative, or the directional concavity, is always positive, so this critical point is a local minimum. Recall that the directional concavity plotted in red in the lower right never crosses the x-axis because the discriminant is negative and thus no real roots exist.
For this critical point example, the second derivative test will result in a local maximum because f sub xx times f sub yy minus f sub xy squared is greater than zero and f sub xx is less than zero. The directional derivative is zero in every possible direction, indicating we're at a critical point. Notice that the directional concavity plot is always negative, so this critical point is a maximum. Once again, the directional concavity never crosses the x-axis because the discriminant is negative. Thus, no real roots exist. For the next critical point example, the second derivative test will result in a saddle point because f sub xx times f sub yy minus f sub xy squared is less than zero. Once again, the directional derivative is zero in all directions, confirming that we are at a critical point. However, this time the directional concavity is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, indicating a saddle point. This occurs because the discriminant discussed earlier is positive and thus two real roots exist. Now we will explore a few examples of inconclusive second derivative tests, the first of which is a saddle point. Notice that the test is inconclusive because f sub xx times f sub y y minus f sub xy squared is equal to zero. Once again, the directional derivative is zero in all directions, indicating a critical point. However, this time the directional concavity is nearly always negative and has a concavity of zero at one value only. This is because the discriminant discussed earlier is zero, and thus our quadratic expression only has a single root. Now we will look at a case where the second derivative test is inconclusive for an extreme value, a local maximum to be precise. The test is inconclusive for the same reasons discussed in the last example. Once again, the directional derivative is always zero. In this case, the concavity is, like in the last example, nearly always negative, except at a single value, the concavity is zero. These last two examples have shown that very similar looking directional curvature graphs can indicate vastly different surfaces when the discriminant discussed prior is equal to zero. Thank you for joining me in this deep dive into the second derivative test. I hope you found as much joy in the usage of the quadratic formula as I did the first time I learned this derivation. I would like to thank two channels for inspiring me to create this video. First, a thank you to Chow Tu for his video working through the derivation. Secondly, I want to thank Dr. Trevor Bazet for his beautifully intuitive take on the second derivative test. You can find both these videos linked in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and leave a like.